It's Saturday, January 23rd, and this is For Good Reason. Welcome to For Good Reason. I'm DJ Grothy. For Good Reason is the radio show and the podcast produced in association with the James Randi Educational Foundation, an international nonprofit whose mission is to advance critical thinking about the paranormal, pseudoscience, and the supernatural. Before we get to this week's guest, James Randi, here's what's going to be a regular feature on For Good Reason. Jamie Ian Swiss, The Honest Liar. What's it mean to be an honest liar? The magician Carl Germain, a famous American stage performer at the turn of the 20th century, said that conjuring is the only absolutely honest profession. The conjurer promises to deceive and does. So you see, if I didn't tell you first, I'd be in advertising or maybe politics. But Germain nailed it. Once I use the word magician, I'm saying I'm going to fool you. But it's okay. It's my job. Whereas a phony psychic, well, that's redundant, but a self-proclaimed psychic or a mind reader is being a dishonest liar. He's lying about the fact that he's lying. He's saying, no, honest, I'm telling you the truth. It's not a trick. It's supernatural powers. Well, I say, screw that lying son of a bitch and the unicorn he rode in on. Now, sometimes people wonder why someone who makes his living as a professional deceiver might get upset about people being deceived. Well, it's because magicians make an honest living as honest liars. And some of us, not all of us, but many magicians are offended when people misuse the tools of our honest living to mislead people about the way the universe works. People who want to manipulate your worldview for prestige, power, or profit. Now, it turns out that magicians have been speaking out about this subject for a very, very long time. The first book published in English that included explanations of magic tricks was called The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott, published in England in 1584. But discovery of witchcraft, discovery in that time and usage meant explanation of, is not a book about magic tricks. It's a book of rational inquiry. Scott wrote the book to debunk the witch burnings that were prevalent in the time of James in England. In fact, when James I subsequently took the throne in 1603, he declared the book heretical and ordered all copies burned, an unmistakable sign of a good book. Now, Scott doesn't claim in the book that witches don't exist. Rather, he questions the evidence. He says that the evidence being presented was insufficient to convict people of witchcraft, and he provides a brief chapter explaining magic tricks to make the point that people can be deceived, but that seeing a magician perform a trick like, well, the cups and balls should not be sufficient cause to burn him at the stake. Thankfully, my job is a little safer these days. Scott was in effect foreshadowing a basic credo of critical thinking popularized by Carl Sagan, among others, to wit... Thine extraordinary claim requireth that thou presenteth some extraordinary uh, provingeth. Whatever. So, that's more than four centuries that magicians and skeptics have been conjoined, at least in the literature, and it's likely that our role as critical thinkers and debunkers of paranormal claims long predates even that. But skip ahead now 250 years to the mid-19th century and the age of spiritualism, when seances and all manner of communication with the dead became a growth industry. Enter Harry Houdini the world's most famous magician, who would become notorious for busting phony seance mediums. Houdini would even attend seances in disguise and then at the appropriate moment suddenly light a match in the dark and unmask the medium as a fraud, catching her in flagrante fallacia, as it were, in blazing trickery, illuminating the medium at the very instant when she had secretly untied her bindings and was waving about bells and tambourines on sticks. By the time Harry Houdini died in 1926, spiritualism was gasping its final breath as well, and the use of physical phenomena, spirits moving objects in the seance room, writing on slates and other ghostly manifestations, would fall all but dead, as it were, for the next 50 years. Until, that is, an obscure Israeli magician arrived on the scene who claimed he could bend silverware just by thinking about it. As long, of course, as he could get his grubby paws on it and fiddle with it for a while, too. And just as the spiritualists at the turn of the century had to contend with Harry Houdini, the metal warpers of the 1970s were challenged by the most important skeptic of our time, James Randi. For myself, I've known Randi first as an inspiration, 
then as a colleague, and finally as a friend. As a boy, I saw him perform magic on a local New York children's program called Wonderama, hosted by Sonny Fox. I saw Randy perform magic, and I knew that's what I wanted to do, too. Later, when I was in my early 20s, Randy wrote a book entitled The Magic of Yuri Geller. That book didn't tell me much I didn't already know about Geller and what he was doing. I'd been doing magic since I was seven years old. I was probably a skeptic by the age of 11. But Randy's book opened my mind to the implications and the dangers of the Gellers of the world. The cost and lost time and resources in pursuing false beliefs. The cost of lost money and perhaps even personal fortunes to purveyors of phony supernatural claims. I'd go into bookstores that didn't carry the book and insist they order it. I'd order half a dozen copies, give them away to people, then order another batch somewhere else. Randy raised my consciousness, my sense of moral outrage. He radicalized me, and he taught me the difference between honest lying and dishonest lying. He taught me what it meant to be an honest liar. This is Jamie Ian Swiss, and I am the Honest Liar. Thanks, Randy. See you next week. Honest. I'm really happy that my first guest on For Good Reason is James Randi. Of course, he's a world-renowned magician, skeptic, investigator of paranormal claims. He's really the central figure in the founding of the worldwide skeptical movement, along with other folks like Carl Sagan, Paul Kurtz, Isaac Asimov, others. Perhaps he's best known for his $1 million challenge, in which the James Randi Educational Foundation will award $1 million to anyone who's able to show evidence of any paranormal, supernatural, or occult power or event under mutually agreed-upon conditions. Randi's appeared widely in the media, including on Johnny Carson, some 22 times. He's also a regular on Penn & Teller's Showtime series Bullshit, He's received a number of awards and recognitions, including the MacArthur Genius Grant and the American Physical Society's Forum Award for promoting public understanding of the relation of physics to society. He's the author of many books, including The Truth About Uri Geller, Flim Flam, and The Faith Healers. James, Randy, welcome to the first episode of For Good Reason. It's good to be here. Let's catch up our listeners uh, on some recent news. First, you finished with your chemo regimen. You're feeling better than ever, right? That's correct, and I managed to beat it very well, mostly due to attitude and following the instructions. It was medical science, not homeopathy, prayer, chanting, or symbols or anything like that that did the job. <laughs> Right. Thank God for medical science, right? Exactly, yes. Okay. In, in this whole process, uh, I know from conversations we've had off the air, you were kind of stunned by how much junk science, how much quack medicine is peddled to cancer patients. Yes, and particularly through the NIH, who in every one of their publications, TJ, they, they mention the possibility of acupuncture as a means of combating side effects of chemotherapy. Now, this is total nonsense. Because acupuncture doesn't work. Mm. And, and yet the NIH is giving tacit approval to it by mentioning it in all of their literature. Now, I've been over to several cancer treatment places here and uh, Gilda's Place and whatnot, very good places to visit when you're undergoing this ordeal. And I've looked through all of the literature and almost invariably anything published by the NIH the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C., an official organ of the U.S. government, will mention the fact that you should ask your physician about acupuncture. That is nonsense. It's, as I say, tacit approval of acupuncture, and I'm trying to do something about that. Why do you think that uh, the federal government would support something like that? Is it moneyed interests? Is it just that they're being uh, open-minded despite the evidence? What is it? I think it's being politically correct, because there are people... Now I find people at this place, even we sit around in the evenings and we chat among ourselves, and I find people say, oh, no, acupuncture has worked beautifully for me. Before acupuncture, oh, I had all kinds of side effects. And you can't fight that sort of thing. These people are convinced that since they show some signs of improvement or lack of side effects, it must be due to the acupuncture. Nonsense. Mm. Well, I know I speak for so many others when I say how thrilled I am that you're back in the saddle, you're feeling a lot better, and uh, end of this month, you're going to, we're hoping you'll get a clean bill of health and then kind of get out there speaking more, doing what you love to do. Oh, yes, and uh, I prefer to do it now, but my physicians have told me just wait till you, you get the PET scan, which is 
going to scan my poor old body, and uh, it's going to tell me whether there are any uh, nodules of cancer still in my lymph glands or some hidden place like that. But it's a very good test. It's painless. I fall asleep in the cylinder, and uh, they wake me up an hour later, and the PET scan is already done. So it's another triumph of medical science. Mm. Other recent news, Randy, well, just yesterday it happened that James McCormick, this huckster who was selling the dowsing devices that supposedly detected bombs, he was arrested in the U.K. on fraud charges. Yes, well, that's only one make of the dowsing things, except that they're all exactly the same. They're junk science, and what they are, the excuse people get away with is, oh, there are no electronics in there that really work. No, because it's dowsing, you see, and they seem to believe in dowsing. Now... I have, as I explained on a video, which is now up on Swift, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, I explain in detail that it was I that was responsible, and therefore the JREF, that was responsible for directing the Department of Energy uh, to uh, investigate the reality or lack of reality of the so-called dowsing rods that were being sold by these con artists, uh, like McCormick, who has, as, as you uh, mentioned there, has now been apprehended. He's been charged with fraud in the U.K. Of course, he'll get out, and he's got millions of dollars to fight it, and he may even run, which, uh, as I say clearly, that would be the best outcome of this whole thing, that McCormick would flee to escape prosecution. That would make him an internationally sought fugitive, and it would prove our case. He doesn't have anything to say, lots of claims, lots of noise, but he has refused to accept the million-dollar challenge of the JRAP for one thing, and it seems odd that a fellow wouldn't want to make for about 20 minutes of his of his valuable time make uh, an investigation of uh, this art, this dowsing stick that he sells, to see whether or not it works. He can make one million dollars, DJ, one million dollars inside of 20 minutes, but he doesn't want that. Now, anybody who doesn't want a million dollars for 20 minutes of work is intellectually and judgmentally challenged, I would say. <laughs> I'd like to let our listeners know that you can find the link to that video where Randy shares his extensive remarks on McCormick and these bomb detection devices on our website, forgoodreason.org. Randy, what amazes me about all of this is that even after your public expose of McCormick's uh, and other similar devices, government officials in the UK, in the US, and in Iraq, they all got snookered. Uh, McCormick sold something like $85 million worth of these things, these ADE-561 bomb detection devices. Um, how can they buy into that even when you're uh, you know, so clearly showing the stuff's bunk? Well, again, there's a lot of political correctness involved here. Uh, for example, we know that in Iraq alone, that they sold so many of these things, and they were sold, incidentally, through a general, an army general there, who insisted the thing worked. Naturally, he insists that it works because he's got a share of the profits of selling this thing. Mm. And they're selling them for up to $60,000 a unit, something with no working electronics in it, no battery whatsoever. It's supposed to work on the human aura and the human magnetic field and such. Total nonsense, quackery of the most advanced nature. So McCormick, uh, he's getting your ire up, but you reserve much of your indignation for these gullible government officials who bought the things. You know, some folks often charge us with doing trivial stuff. Oh, that skepticism stuff is trivial. Here's an example, though, Randy, of how untrivial it is. Belief in these untested pseudoscience claims, they actually cost lives. If you think the gizmo is going to detect bombs and it doesn't, people will die. Well, for example, the ADE-651, which is the one that uh, that McCormick has been currently selling, this is the one which is used at all entrances and exits of every major uh, access to the city of Baghdad. For example, that's only one example of where it's used. It's used all over the Middle East, uh, in, in cafes, and in police departments, at military depots, uh, on access points, on roads, and at inter intersections where they want to inspect vehicles, and often these vehicles leave that, that scene and half a block away they blow up because they've got bombs aboard them. Mm. The ADE-651 machine is, and it's not a machine, it's just a, a, a farce. This is similar, very similar to all the other machines, including the, the Quadro and the Mole and these various other so-called dowsing rods. It does 
not work and it costs lives of civilians and militia all over the country. Mm, all over the world. Randy, let me ask you, uh, why, uh, why you? Why are you this magician, kind of critical thinking advocate? Why does it fall to you to raise the alarm bells about these dowsing devices that uh, purport to save people's lives by detecting bombs when they don't actually work? Why does it fall on a magician, critical thinking skeptic rather than some governmental body or some watchdog group? I mean, everybody else is asleep at the wheel is what I'm saying. It falls on you to do this. Why, why is that? Well, I really wish I knew, DJ. I, I don't quite understand it yet, except, again, for the political correctness rule, uh, all uh, the Army uh, and, and the military uh, forces all over the world are subject to commanding officers. If the commanding officer says, this is something we should look into, or this is something we should buy. No one dares make any questions about it or offer any objections. They simply buy the thing. Now, I have a couple of contacts, and I won't tell you within what agency, mm -hmm. because uh, I don't want to expose these people. Right, we don't want to make that public. Well, we don't want to make it public because we would betray these people's confidence. But I've heard from them privately, quite a few people, just uh, two days ago, for example, and, uh, and and from other agencies, again, that we won't mention, mm -hmm. uh, who are saying, yes, you're absolutely right, Mr. Randy, I wish I could get somebody here to do something, but they're helpless because there's somebody is uh, in higher rank than they are that believes that this stuff works, or even if they don't believe that it works, they want to say, I did the correct thing. They're very much like lawyers whose answer is always, no, don't do this, and then they try to get around <laughs> the possibilities of, of uh, errors that they might find in their procedure. But the safe answer is no. Uh, don't look into this thing. Don't go any further with it. Mm. So as I was suggesting earlier in our conversation, if anyone wants a concrete, crystal clear example of how skepticism matters, uh, you know, this kind of skepticism, your work here will actually save lives. If it weren't for you raising the alarm bell about McCormick, he wouldn't have been investigated. He wouldn't have been arrested on fraud charges. That's uh, the way I see it. That's very true. Mm. So I wanted you on our first show, uh, not only so we could touch on some of th these recent news items, but so that we could let our listeners know what's in store for them at the James Randi Educational Foundation. You and I have had some long discussions over the last couple months about strategy for the foundation going forward. We're excited to build on the great track record of the foundation even while we're really revved up to try some new things to increase our impact. Uh, what's, um, what's getting you excited uh, looking into the future of the foundation? Well, almost everything, uh, DJ. I must say, since you came aboard, we've had uh, big changes made here. You've had to initiate some, uh, some well, I was going to say unfortunate, but not unfortunate, but uh, difficult to swallow uh, adaptations and changes in the in the, the, the general setup of the JREF, and I have uh, stood back and I've watched you do this sort of thing. You've done it with, with grace and with uh, delicacy, and I must say, and I think you will admit, our staff has taken these adjustments. Uh, they have accepted what you've said, and there hasn't been any problem involved in it. I had a couple of, uh, oh, maybe minor disappointments and changes, but and nothing that is going to affect the operation of the JREF. In fact, the JREF is soaring ahead. You've made a great change, and I thank you for that. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I couldn't agree with you more about the staff. It's a great team, a lot of innovative ideas, energy, enthusiasm, and the commitment level is really impressive to me. What's amazing about the staff is how just fiercely loyal they are to your vision for advancing critical thinking and, and skepticism out there, and they work long hours. Um, uh, as you mentioned, we've uh, instituted some just nonprofit business management practices, but everyone's uh, revved up and excited, and we're all rolling up our sleeves to do the important work of the foundation. I'm excited. You're excited. Let's talk about some of the specifics. Um, well, uh, first is the Million Dollar Challenge. It's not going away. In fact, we're going to continue it and even work to expand it in various ways, right? Yes, that's right, and uh, many people have written me, but, but the, the, uh, the challenge is being terminated. They don't read the page carefully, obviously, because uh, quite some months ago I came up with an announcement that because the woo-woos out there were celebrating the fact that the $30 challenge was off, and 
as you know, DJ, it's very obvious to anyone, this is the one factor that they consider in their way. They can't get away with their flummery unless they get rid of the Million Dollar Challenge because they don't have an adequate response to it. Why don't you take the Million Dollar Challenge? Now, Murray Geller won't answer that. And the, the other people, like John Edwards, don't answer it. When I wrote to John Edwards' representative at the, at the network uh, when he was uh, on American television with his regular program, Crossing Over, I got a letter from this press agent which merely said, Dear Sir, that's me, Apparently, <laughs> John Edwards does not respond to criticism, period. Yours truly has signed it. This is an answer? He doesn't want a million dollars? Now, if John Edwards doesn't want a million dollars for doing 20 minutes of a test of his powers, I think the man is intellectually, and as I said previously, judgmentally challenged. Mm. Who doesn't want a million dollars? I know that I'd be champing at the bit to get it, and you'd think there'd be a lineup outside my home or outside the JRAF office this very moment. But there isn't. Isn't that strange? It's crazy if there's a million dollars on the table and someone has an ability or can substantiate a claim to get that million dollars and then they walk away from it. That doesn't make any sense. I agree. So our plans uh, to expand the million dollar challenge, uh, we want to take it on the road, not just uh, take applications, but do some live tests. Really, it's our chief means of raising awareness about these, I think, irresponsible claimants, uh, or at least the irresponsible claims. It's also the big way we have of raising consciousness among the public about their own responsibility to be skeptical about all this stuff. Another thing, though, DJ, I must interrupt you for just one second. I'm increasingly now, in the last few weeks, I've gotten uh, notes from people who say, I have this wonderful power, but I don't want my name used, and I don't want to be tested in public. I just want to do this all very privately, and I don't want anyone to know my identity. I Get out of here. Come on. You want a million dollars, you've got to go along with the rules. I won't make any exception to those rules, nor will you, of course. These are firmly established rules. They're right on the web page. You can find that by clicking in on Million Dollar Challenge. You'll see all the rules there. And these people decide, oh, but I'm, I'm special because I've really got the powers. I'm not like the other fakes, you see. I'm the one that's got the power, so I want exceptions. They won't get any exceptions. You do it our way or you don't do it. You're not offering a million dollars. We're offering the million dollars. Right, and on that point, sometimes we're, we're challenged by claimants who say, oh, the deck is stacked, your rules are unfair. No, in fact, the rules are public. We just want a way to... Uh, shine the light of the public on the process. That's why everything's public. That's why we want people to reveal their names. If they're making a claim that should overturn the laws of physics, say, well, they should be willing to stand up and take credit for it, right? I would think so, and take the prize. A and more than that, uh, the tests that we conduct are conducted uh, under mutually agreed upon scientific circumstances. So it's not that uh, the JREF has these challenges or these tests that no one has a say in. No, it's mutually agreed upon. If some claimant comes and tries for the million dollars, you, you know, we actually want someone to win the million dollars if it means that they're real and we've discovered some as yet unreported amazing claim. Well, I can see a, a Nobel Prize here at least, can't you, DJ? Emphatically, yes. And it, it just so happens that in all the years you've offered the Million Dollar Challenge, no one has ever come forward with evidence to substantiate their claims. That's correct. It's been tested for more than 10 years now, and uh, none of these people have, have beaten the odds at all. Uh, and the odds are very fairly stacked in their direction, in their favor. Our statisticians make sure that that's the case. And yet no one can beat the odds so far. Now, maybe tomorrow or maybe in the next 20 minutes, somebody will come forward. And maybe this broadcast itself will stimulate people out there to say, oh, well, I've got the power. I guess I can easily prove it. But mm. read the rules first, please. Don't bother us with all kinds of factuous claims that you're too shy or uh, you've got uh, something in the oven that you, you can't reveal. Uh, come on, do the thing. Perform, do your thing, collect a million dollars, and go home laughing. So when you hear a claimant dismiss the Million Dollar Challenge as just a publicity stunt, uh, your response is, well, there is a publicity aspect about it. We want to raise people's awareness, their consciousness, but 
it's not that we're disinterested in discovering successful paranormal claimants. Yes, there's a publicity element, but we also are genuinely inquiring to try to find out if any of these claims are real. That's true. Now, I don't expect any of them, to be quite frank with you. Uh, you, you said earlier that we want someone to win the million-dollar prize. Now, my personal uh, impetus is not that I want someone to win the million-dollar prize. I frankly don't expect it because I've been in this business. Well, I'm, I'm 81 now, going on 82. I've been in the business since I was about 14 years of age. I've investigating these things. And that experience over all those decades, I'll let you do the subtraction because I'm not that great at mathematics. You see. <laughs> so after you do the subtraction, you will find out the number of years that I've actually had this offer uh, up in front of people, though it, was, it wasn't always a million dollars. At one time, it was only a $1,000, and then it was 10000 and then it became a million. But we've had this offer out there all this time. I don't expect that anyone's going to be able to beat it. It won't be because we've stacked anything against them. This is done in the open, as you say, very plainly, uh, frankly, in the open. Everybody can see it. They can see the development of it, and they can judge it for themselves. It's done 100% fairly, and in very, very, very large majority of cases, I'm not involved. You're not involved. In fact, no one from the JREF is actually involved. These are usually done in other countries, in the homeland of the people who, who are making the claims, uh, as far as Russia and Argentina and Canada, all over the United States and Europe, of course. It's done there by people who are certified as having the ability to conduct fair tests. They're all academics. They're statisticians, they're scientists, and you can't question their integrity or their ability. So we have nothing to do with it. We just get the report from these people saying, oops, they failed. Not much of a surprise to us, but there it is. Yeah, but on that point, so you've been around the block. You think it's unlikely any of these claimants are real, but you're not so close-minded that uh, if someone won, they wouldn't get the million dollars. I mean, it's really there for the taking if anyone proves it. Well, not only that. We are legally committed. You see, by law, if you examine our webpage where we promise this sort of thing, I've done it in my books, I've done it in my articles, I've done it in all of my public lectures and speeches around the world. I have declared the presence of this million-dollar challenge. It's there. The million dollars is with Goldman Sachs in New York City. It's on deposit there. It gathers interest for us every year. I forgot what it's at now. It's a $1.4 million or something right now. And we can take that excess off the top to help run the foundation if and when we might need it. We don't usually do that because the rate of interest is very good on such an account. The money is there. The prize is real. It's all on offer, and we are legally committed to paying the million dollars. Any lawyer will tell you that. We have declared ourselves publicly and out in the open. We are declared. Now, there's a fellow in Australia uh, who you'll be, you'll, you'll know the name, Samus. This man has been saying, for years now, there's no million dollars, there's no such offer, that he is lying and such. In fact, we post the Goldman Sachs statements on our website, yeah. That's right, and, and if, we, if we did that and it was not proper, Goldman Sachs would certainly be suing our ass immediately. They wouldn't stand for anything like that. Mm. And Zamet in Australia is a lawyer, you see, now retired, I believe, but this guy has been claiming that it's not a legitimate offer, and he's wanted us to make a firm commitment with a document. Now, I drew up the document. I had lawyers help me do it. I mailed it off to him and said, we will sign this document. Is this satisfactory? Silence, DJ. Mm -hmm. Silence. We haven't heard from Zamet since that point. He now knows he's confronted with the facts. We will sign the document as presented, and it is legally binding internationally in school. And yet, he won't approve of that document. He won't correspond with us in any way whatsoever. So Zamet, he knows, and he won't admit it. Well, of course he won't uh, accept the document because he gets more play out of making the baseless charge that the million-dollar challenge is fake than you know actually working with us to use the million-dollar challenge to ferret out uh, unsuccessful or possibly successful claimants. So touching on just a couple other things, uh, Randy, uh, looking forward to the future of the JREF, we've decided to renew our investment in the grassroots, grassroots skeptical organizing, and this means regional workshops, more resources to local skeptics groups. You really see the grassroots as the future of organized skepticism. Oh, absolutely. There's no 
there's no question of that. And I think that your president, Ski J, has done a great deal uh, to promote this uh, this attitude and this uh, venture within uh, the James Randi Educational Foundation. Uh, it's pretty well due to you, and I give you full credit. Mm. Well, uh, a- as you mentioned earlier, though, you have a great team there already, and we're, we're all working together to implement this kind of vision at the grassroots. I'm excited like you are. One last thing. I want to mention before we finish up, and I know you're incredibly enthusiastic about this prospect, it's the expansion of the amazing meetings around the world. Last year saw our first international amazing meeting in London. We're repeating that this year, as well as expanding into Australia. Very excited about that. Then next year, hopefully into Europe. So question about this international expansion. People everywhere are asking us. I've seen the emails. I've gotten some myself. Uh, people want us to come into their countries and do a national conference on critical thinking, a, an amazing meeting in this, that, or the other country. Why do you think there's all this new interest in amazing meetings around the world, Randy? Well, I think that people are getting more aware of the JRF, of course, and of our work in general. Certainly, uh, Switzerland is very much aware of it. I've got a lot of good friends in Switzerland, and they have been emailing me, oh, I hear you're coming to Switzerland. That's the European connection that you referred to a moment mm-hmm. ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can't wait to get to Switzerland again. Not only is it a beautiful country with wonderful, wonderful people, who are very um, curious, very scientifically minded people who really want to see something like this happen. Uh, it'll happen in 2011, I believe, in Switzerland. That's the present uh, plan. And right. it'll take a, a while to get that underway. But I can't wait to expand uh, internationally. And we have some possible affiliations with other skeptical groups coming up as well. But we won't speak about that because that's all in formation, right? <laughs> exactly. We, we can say we're very excited about strategic alliances with groups around the world. A lot is in the works. And I could not be more optimistic even as a skeptic, you know, not a cynic, but a skeptic about the future of the James Randi Educational Foundation and and with your kind of vision and inspiring folks both at the grassroots and at the foundation, it, it's just nothing but critical thinking uh, success going forward. Well, before leaving, DJ, I, I'm going to give our listeners a little bit of a secret about you. Oh. You see, I... <laughs> <laughs> I must say that uh, I, I think that, uh, and I, I may be wrong in this, but I think that uh, you were saying, for example, when you announced to me privately in, in the confidential emails, some of the changes that were going to be made, made at the JREF, and you wondered uh, on those uh, correspondences with me, you just wondered whether or not the staff was going to take it correctly. And I assured you that there was no problem, that they were flexible, that they were willing to accept I think you were a bit surprised to find uh, how easily it went down with the staff because they're all thinking, rational people, and they're accepting. They know that you're the new boss here, and uh, you were just a, a tad surprised, I think, that they took it that easily. Am I correct? You're correct. You must be a mind reader because, you know, when I took uh, up the helm of the JREF, as everyone knows, nonprofits, not just the JREF, but nonprofits all over the place, sometimes have to make minor course corrections to have uh, it more increased impact for their missions. And coming into an organization that I hadn't been a part of, I had these questions, as you recount, I have been incredibly impressed with both the enthusiasm and the commitment, but also the, you know, the kind of stick to of the staff. People are rolling up their sleeves saying, okay, uh, uh, let's figure out what we need to do to take the JREF to the next level. So you're absolutely right. There's not only a lot of enthusiasm, but there's a lot of just kind of nose to the grindstone mentality. And that's what we need if we're going to continue growing like the JREF needs to grow in order to respond to all of these irresponsible claims in the, in society. We were talking about the you know, the ADE 561 bomb detection devices earlier and how the government b- bought into all of that and it was up to you to ring the alarm bells. That's why the JREF is so important. It kind of stands between all the credulous masses out there who believe nonsense, some of which is actually harmful, it stands between the, the nonsense claims and the public. We do a vital work, and I'm excited about the team we have to do that work. So, Randy, thanks for uh, having me aboard, and, and nothing but uh, good, good stuff to report for the future. Well, welcome to the group, uh, DJ. It's uh, been a great pleasure 
having this bit of a broadcast. I, I must say, uh, re your recent your your last remark there. Uh, you said the government, but you're talking about governments all over the world because in every country of the world they have accepted these so-called dowsing rods, mm -hmm. and I think we're doing all those folks a great favor as well. I certainly hope so. Well, thank you, Randy, and uh, we look forward to talking to you next time you're on the show. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this first episode of For Good Reason. I want to especially single out Richard Dawkins and the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science for generous initial underwriting support to make For Good Reason possible. To get involved with an online conversation about today's show, join the discussion at forgoodreason.org. Views expressed on For Good Reason aren't necessarily the views of the James Randi Educational Foundation. Questions and comments on today's show can be sent to info at forgoodreason.org. For Good Reason is produced by Thomas Donnelly and recorded from St. Louis, Missouri. Our music is composed for us by Emmy Award-nominated Gary Stockdale. Contributors to today's show included Jamie Ian Swiss and Christina Stevens. I'm your host, DJ Grothy. Scott was in effect foreshadowing a basic credo of critical thinking popularized by Carl Sagan, among others, to wit... Thine extraordinary claim requireth that thou presenteth some extraordinary uh, provingeth. Whatever. So, that's more than four centuries that magicians and skeptics have been conjoined, at least in the literature, and it's likely that our role as critical thinkers and debunkers of paranormal claims long predates even that. But skip ahead now 250 years to the mid-19th century and the age of spiritualism, when seances and all manner of communication with the dead became a growth industry. Enter Harry Houdini the world's most famous magician, who would become notorious for busting phony seance mediums. Houdini would even attend seances in disguise and then at the appropriate moment suddenly light a match in the dark and unmask the medium as a fraud. Catch it. He's lying about the fact that he's lying. He's saying, no, honest, I'm telling you the truth. It's not a trick. It's supernatural powers. Well, I say, screw that lying son of a bitch and the unicorn he rode in on. Now, sometimes people wonder why someone who makes his living as a professional deceiver might get upset about people being deceived. Well, it's because magicians make an honest living as honest liars. And some of us, not all of us, but many magicians are offended when people misuse the tools of our honest living to mislead people about the way the universe works. People who want to manipulate your worldview for prestige, power, or profit. Now, it turns out that magicians have been speaking out about this subject for a very, very long time. The first book published in English that included explanations of magic tricks was called The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott, published in England in 1584. But discovery of witchcraft, discovery in that time and usage meant explanation of, is not a book about magic tricks. It's a book of rational inquiry. Scott wrote the book to debunk the witch burnings that were prevalent in the time of Jamesy in England. In fact, when James I subsequently took the throne in 1603, he declared the book heretical and ordered all copies burned, an unmistakable sign of a good book. Now, Scott doesn't claim in the book that witches don't exist. Rather, he questions the evidence. He says that the evidence being presented was insufficient to convict people of witchcraft, and he provides a brief chapter explaining magic tricks to make the point that people can be deceived, but that seeing a magician perform a trick like, well, the cups and balls should not be sufficient cause to burn him at the stake. Thankfully, my job is a little safer these days. It's Saturday, January 23rd, and this is For Good Reason. Welcome to For Good Reason. I'm DJ Grothy. For Good Reason is the radio show and the podcast produced in association with the James Randi Educational Foundation, an international nonprofit whose mission is to advance critical thinking about the paranormal, pseudoscience, and the supernatural. Before we get to this week's guest, James Randi, here's what's going to be a regular feature on For Good Reason Jamie Ian Swiss, The Honest Liar. What's it mean to be an honest liar? 
The magician Carl Germain, a famous American stage performer at the turn of the 20th century, said that conjuring is the only absolutely honest profession. The conjurer promises to deceive and does. So you see, if I didn't tell you first, I'd be in advertising or maybe politics. But Germain nailed it. Once I use the word magician, I'm saying, I'm going to fool you. But it's okay. It's my job. Whereas a phony psychic, well, that's redundant, but a self-proclaimed psychic or a mind reader is being a dishonest liar.